Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you and welcome to our MIFOS community webinar series. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing to you today Ken Banks, who's a longtime and well respected and innovative pioneer in ICT for D space. He's recently joined as the head of social impact at Yoti, and they recently launched their social impact strategy, which came at a very good time as digital identity is currently a topic that's being actively discussed amongst the community and something we're actively trying to pursue uh, the proper integration with in the new microservices architecture of generation three of MIFOS. So I'm gonna pass it on over to Ken. I wanna first off thank him for taking the time today to share the work that Yoti is doing. And I hope this can be the first step towards collaboration amongst IoT and FinTech and financial institutions amongst our ecosystem to better leverage digital, digital identity for good. So thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ed. Uh, hopefully I'm coming through loud and clear for everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you all. I've uh, known of MIFOS for a very long time. Um, and as Ed said, I've been spending uh, most of my recent career working in the ICT for D space uh, up until early last year when I joined uh, Yoti, a digital identity company, as the head of social impact. Uh, and again, as Ed said, the timing for me, uh, as well as I guess lots of people, has been quite a good one. Uh, digital identities are becoming a very hot topic um, for, for the right reasons in many cases, but also I guess there's also some downsides to things or at least problems that digital identities could solve um, that aren't currently solving. So what I'd like to do for the next, um, well, half hour or 45 minutes, or whatever it will be, is to give you a bit of background as to who Yoti are, um, what we do as a company, uh, what products we have, and the kinds of identity problems that those products can solve. And then I'll talk a little bit about the social impact strategy that we launched uh, last month, which is very much focused on trying to help the uh, use of digital identities for, for social good uh, around the world. Uh, I think we're going to hold back questions till the end. So I think if you have anything you want to you want to ask, just fire it through on the chat. And then once I've finished, we will then go through the questions and um, I'll be happily answer the ones that I can answer. So keep them simple if you can, please. OK, so um, as a starting point, I think that we can probably all agree that the way that we prove who we are online uh, and in many cases in person as well um, is broken and uh, identity theft is an increasing worry for people. Um, the way that people are able to continually get onto sites they shouldn't be getting onto, uh, trolling, um, mimicking, uh, abusive behavior, um, fraud. I mean, there's a whole range of things, uh, behaviors online, which are becoming increasingly problematic I think Tim Berners-Lee mentioned some of these last week as the web celebrated its 30th anniversary that was sort of at a tipping point really. And so the status, status at the moment or the state of play at the moment is that there are plenty of problems out there. Fortunately, there are solutions, but we just have to figure out the behavioral side of how we go about deploying those. Uh, Yoti is uh, a new way of proving who you are online and in person. So the key is that you can actually use it online uh, to interact with a site uh, and to share a particular element of your ident identity depending on what you're doing but you can also use it in person as well to prove that you're over 18 or to prove your address or whatever details you might want to be sharing uh, we're a global identity platform so at the moment you can um, scan documents in 160 over 160 countries that's passports driving licenses uh, national identity cards, uh, and that's where your um, identity credentials are taken from when you create a, a Yoti. So we have a trusted identity platform because the attributes of your identity are taken from legally issued documentation, which you would one would assume is legally issued and properly issued by the country of origin. Um, and once you have that digital identity, you can use it to prove who you are very, very quickly and very, very easily. Um, whenever you need to. Uh, we're about three and a half million, approaching four million uh, installs uh, now. So we're, we're starting to get some nice traction. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're global in reach. We have offices in two or three 
countries, uh, quite a large team. Um, we are a startup, but we do have a lot of people. Um, it's 230 odd, maybe 250 now. Um, privately funded. Uh, we have very, very strong uh, bank level encryption. Privacy by, by design goes right back to the very, very beginnings of the, pro the initial product that we developed, our main app, uh, going back to about 2004. So it's not something that we've bolted on more recently because it's become quite trendy, but something that's been built in very much from the beginning. And I can talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And we have some very, very interesting use cases, everything from private companies to governments uh, and increasingly charities. Uh, app installs have been increasingly uh, on the rise, which is obviously very nice to see, um, approaching the 4 million mark now. And there's many different things that you can do with uh, a Yoti digital identity, things like proving your age, um, verifying who you are for an online service. Uh, you're able to keep your data safe. You can use it to log in. You can use your biometric information to log into websites, so you no longer have to remember passwords. You can uh, legally sign documents using your biometric signatures uh, and authorized payments. And also we're working on a number of travel solutions as well, where you can seamlessly go through a travel booking and through an airport because we are confident that we know who you are. So just very quickly, how uh, how you would create Yoti on a smartphone. Um, so I'll, I'll speak it through now and it will generally flow what you see on your on your screen there. So you download Yoti from the App Store, Google Play or the um, iPhone Store. Uh, once you've installed that, you take a selfie um, and then we from there get the biometric information of your of your face. Then you are presented three random words which you read onto into your phone when a video is made. That video is sent to a security center that we have where we have uh, teams of super recognizers and, and spotters who will look to see that the person saying the words in the video is the same person that took the selfie where the biometrics have been generated from. If we are happy that it's the same person and that no spoofing has been carried out, no masks or other um, trickery, then you have the basis of your digital identity. So you have an identity which shows that you are a unique individual, but at that point, there are no attributes to your identity. There's no, no name attached to it, no date of birth, um, no um, gender or no address or whatever. So then you use the phone on the uh, app to take a picture of your driving license uh, where supported or your passport where supported or ID card. We then extract the, the fields from those documents to create a series of attributes for an identity. So my personal IoT Identity is made up of about 11 different attributes. Uh, my name is stored separately and encrypted separately from my gender. It's stored and encrypted separately from my date of birth, which is stored and encrypted separately from my um, address and so on. So your identity is broken up into different components uh, and individually encrypted, and only you hold the keys to that data on your device. So if there's a backup of that data on our servers, you are dark to us. We can't actually read any of your identity information, which is an interesting uh, thing when you think about today where, where quite often people's data is the main product uh, and the main currency of a lot of these services. People kind of give up their right to um, remaining private as a, the price to pay for using a free service. Yoti will always be free to the end user. The people that pay are the businesses who are asking to check you are a certain age or living in a certain place and so on. So just, it's just worth remembering that with a Yoti digital identity, we cannot see anything about you. You are entirely private and only you choose where you share individual attributes of your identity based on what you're trying to do. There's a whole bunch of uh, advanced technologies behind uh, the app and behind the services that we use. I'm happy to share some of these slides later if you don't get a chance to see everything on them. One or two of them like this one are a little bit heavy. Um, but just to make the point here that we have developed a number of proprietary technologies uh, which enable us to uh, check ages and make sure that things aren't being spoofed and, and so on. Uh, we work across um, many sectors and with many brands, so increasingly getting traction now uh, with um, larger companies uh, as increasing interest in the work that we're doing and obviously increasing interest in the broader issue of digital identities. Uh, in addition to the private uh, and corporate sectors, 
it's interesting that a lot of governments and regulators are now starting to take an interest in the product. And I'll give a couple of examples in a few minutes of how uh, one or two governments are beginning to do work with us uh, in those areas. And as you can imagine, there's a, a growing interest in uh, KYC and so on, which would be, be particularly uh, relevant to a MIFOS type discussion where there's obviously a need to know your customer and to be sure that you know who you're dealing with. And digital identities are a very good way of, of KYC checking as well, if they're proven to be trustworthy uh, and reliable. Uh, in terms of how it can be used, well, there's, um, there's a few examples on here. Everything from um, making sure that only people who are old enough to buy certain products are able to buy them. Um, KYC, making sure people are the right age to get into nightclubs, allowing people to use a digital identity to access government services, to make sure that only certain people who are allowed to see certain rated films can only see those films, to prove addresses uh, when you are ordering goods online or takeaways, uh, proving that you your face is your face when you're on a dating site so that people know that they are meeting the person that is actually on the dating profile rather than someone's used a picture from a, a modeling agency or whatever it might be, and um, that's surprisingly common. Uh, so there's a whole range of different things, making sure that only certain people can get into certain buildings and onto certain floors, so property access management and so on. Once you have the base identity, there are quite a lot of uses for that and ways that you can deploy, deploy it. Uh, on the development side, and again, I think this might be interesting to, to some of you here, that we do have um, SDKs for um, most of the more popular languages. Um, we also have um, plugins for the more common content management systems as well. So it's for someone who knows what they're doing, uh, it's a relatively quick process to integrate the Yoti service, the, um, the Yoti identification checking service into an app or into a website that you might be um, might be building. So there's a whole section on the, the developer side of this on the yoti.com developers uh, section, which you're more than welcome to go and check out at some point if you're interested in, in doing that. Uh, there's also a site called Yoti World, which will allow you, once you have a Yoti on your phone, you can actually have a little play and experiment with different sectors that you might want to use your Yoti in. Uh, so if you download Yoti and create your identity and then go to Yoti World, you'll be presented with a range of QR codes and other ways of interacting with test sites. Of course, your data is not kept, it's dark anyway, so you can play around this with this confidently knowing that uh, you're not, not revealing any data anywhere. But it's a nice way of seeing how you might use Yoti in a travel environment, how you might use Yoti in an age-restricted goods environment, how you might use Yoti in a travel environment. So it's a nice, a nice way of getting a sense of the utility of a digital identity. So a few, um, a few real life examples of how digital identities in our case are being uh, currently used. So depending on where you are and where you're dialing into this call, this may or may not be relevant, but for many people who go to a self checkout at a supermarket who have perhaps got a bottle of whiskey or some beer uh, in, their, in their basket, as you're of course scanning the barcodes, the minute you scan something which is age restricted, Quite often there'll be a flashing red light, something might beep, a staff member will probably run from the other corner of the store, maybe it'll be the second or third time they've done that in the last couple of minutes. They'll run over, they will look at you, they will perhaps ask you for ID if you look close to being the age, but if you're comfortably over, they will say, yep, you're fine, they'll punch in a supervisor's code and then you can continue with your shopping. With Yoti, you can be presented with a QR code, which you can see on this screen here, and you can simply share your uh, a true false age attribute with the checkout that you're over 18 or over 21. You don't need to actually share your date of birth itself, but, but Yoti can share the fact that you're over a certain threshold or not. And then if you are, then the checkout just continues running through um, without there needing to be somebody running around. Also, we have a, um, an age scan service. So you can also uh, look, at a, look at the camera on the display uh, and we have an age estimation tool, which um, is proving to be pretty accurate. So the store might have a threshold of 25 or 26 for people who are 21 or over, just to make sure they don't um, bleed into that, that uh, age limit. But if you don't have Yoti, you can simply stare at the screen and we'll do an age estimation. And of course, that image is then removed. So there's no trace of you having done the, 
done the check. Um, there's also, this is a, the thing I was just mentioning there, the age estimation that you can, um, you can go through. It takes about three seconds. Um, and so that's, um, that's that one there. Uh, also, um, we have QR codes uh, and a number of smaller retailers are finding these very useful that they print out a QR code and stick it on the front of their till. Every time somebody comes into the shop to buy an age restricted good, they simply use their Yoti to scan that QR code. Uh, Yoti can read from that what information is required and then the screen on the phone can give a verification or not that the person is old enough to buy that good. So this is a really quick, low tech in a sense way of a, a retailer being able to check that somebody uh, is uh, the right age to be buying something. It's very, very easy for the, uh, the Yoti user to do it as well. So it's all about removing friction in these particular cases. As I say, a lot of the smaller retailers are finding this really quite a nice solution that using QR codes um, works very well for them on their, on their tills. Also, in terms of travel, we have some uh, pilots coming up soon at Heathrow Airport to allow people to book their travel using their Yoti digital identity uh, and then to seamlessly work their way through the airport based on the fact that their identity has been trusted and proved all the way from the booking onwards. Uh, so that that would be things that you'll be hearing more about more about soon. On the government side, I mentioned a bit earlier that a number of governments are uh, taking interest in, in Yoti. So in Jersey, in the Channel Islands, not New Jersey, but the Jersey, funnily enough, that I was born in, uh, in Jersey, you can use Yoti to access, or you will be able to use Yoti to access government services. So to file your tax return or read your um, tax or your health records or whatever it might be. So in Jersey, you would create your own Yoti on your phone and that would be your login into uh, government services on the island. Uh, also in Scotland, the improvement service have um, just begun trials of Yoti as well to allow Scottish citizens to pretty much do the same, to use a digital identity to access uh, government online government services in, in Scotland. And we have a, a growing number of governments around the world who are now speaking to us about ways that Yoti could be used uh, to allow their citizens to access their service. And I think the fact that we have um, a very strong privacy by design and very strong ethics around the fact that we can't read data, we can't share data, the data is genuinely private to the users, uh, and that the only business model is people paying to have elements of an identity proven, makes people feel comfortable that um, they're not encouraging their citizens to download something which would then perhaps become uh, a minefield for uh, having their personal data harvested. That would never happen uh, with Yoti. We also have a document signing service uh, called Yoti Sign. So uh, for those of you who have used things like VeriSign, uh, as you will know, you, you give an email address which goes off to the person who's signing the documents. And it's kind of assumed that the person who's accessing that email is actually the person who they say they are. Uh, and they sign it um, without actually really signing it, but they click on a box to indicate a signature and it goes back and then that is assumed to be a legally binding verified signature. But of course, people can access other people's email, they can hack into email, so it's not always that secure. Using Yoti, you can invite somebody to sign a document and they would sign it using their biometric uh, identity and the attributes from their identity. So you can be 100% sure that the person who is actually agreeing to that document or agreeing to that contract is the person that you have sent it to because only they are able to, um, to sign that document and unlock it because of who they are. So it's a, it's a very, very secure uh, and trusted way. And again, this service is becoming increasingly popular with estate agents and organizations, legal offices where contracts have to be signed online or through email as a matter of course. Uh, also checking that people are who they say they are when they go into buildings and go into clubs and, and so on, which is good for security if you have a secure building. Uh, things like that are coming up in the UK soon, things like proving your age when you're accessing things like adult sites or age restricted sites, stopping people who are underage from getting into these sites, which of course is also very important. So again, you could prove to a website that you are over 18 or over 21 without sharing anything else about who you are. 
It's unlike you know having to hand over credit card details where in the olden days people a lot of, a lot of sites would tend to use credit cards to assume that people are certain ages. Now you can simply share the fact that you are over a certain age to access a certain site or to buy a certain good online without sharing anything else about you. So it's incredibly private and you can be incredibly selective about what you share. Also mentioned um, know your customers and, and sanctions and other checks. So again, you can be confident that the person who is, they are who they say they are when they're signing up for an account or they're signing up for a particular service where you need to be, you're legally bound to do a know your customer check. Uh, and we also have a password manager, which I use um, called Yosi Password Manager which allows you to link your passwords on your sites to your Yoti. So um, I find it's very useful that I go onto a site, you'll see on this site here, if you click on the little Yoti symbol at the end of the, uh, end of say the email box there, you unlock your Yoti on your phone, which then transmits the password to the site to let you in. If you don't have access to the online, uh, to the Yoti on the phone, because you're not who you say you are, then you can't get into the site. So Yoti Password Manager is another nice way of securing your, your passwords and using your digital identity to unlock access to your, to your sites. So that's, that's generally the, the company side of things. That's the a range of products and the range of things that the, co the, the corporate business side uh, of Yoti is working on. But we're also incredibly interested in social impact. We realize that there are many social problems and challenges for people out there who either have identity stolen or don't have identities at all. Uh, and there are good and bad ways of doing things. And we're very, very keen to use the same principles that we apply to our business uh, on the social impact side of our work. So when I joined last April, we did something of a reboot to think about how we could support the use of good uh, digital identities around the world. And so we've been doing research in a number of areas and speaking to quite a few people. And the result has been the um, the release of this new strategy, which I'll I can whiz you through um, with you through now. I mean, as I mentioned, our overall objective is to to leverage the potential of digital identities to help drive positive social and environmental change. So we're looking to to figure out ways of making them uh, making them more accessible or helping build better tools or more appropriate tools for people out there who are in particular trying to help people who either don't have identities or um, struggle to prove who they are. The strategy is very much a learning one. So we recognize that there's a lot that we don't know. When I say we, I think we're talking more broadly about the sector, because if you look at what the digital identity sector is doing, a lot of it is quite top down. It's quite heavy at the top level. So there's lots of interest, for example, in Aadhaar and how a, the Indian government led identification platform is being used or has impacted citizens. But it often starts with the technology and the people who are using it are, are kind of it's more about how they are impacted rather than understanding what it is that they might have wanted in the first place. So what we're very interested in trying to understand is how do people want to use a digital identity? What are their motivations? What are their concerns? What are the use cases? Um, what should we be aware of? What would nonprofits working with rural communities or last mile communities want to do with one? Uh, and can we help build the right tools that provide this uh, digital identity service in the right way? So we have six activities uh, as part of this strategy, and I'll, um, I'll actually whiz you through them now so you can just ignore this a minute. So the first one, we're launching a fellowship program uh, probably next month. So anyone in the MIFOS community is more than welcome to, um, to apply for this, or if they know anybody uh, who is working with communities or working in last mile or near last mile environments with disenfranchised communities uh, either there are issues and challenges around identity there's political problems there's policy issues there are issues and challenges around the technologies that are available and how they might not be the right technologies we're inviting people there'll be three this year to apply for a fellowship and we will support them for one year with a, a fairly generous stipend to allow them to investigate that problem or help unpick that problem or to help write a policy paper or to think about designing a technology that might solve that problem and again what we're looking to do here is throw the ball back into the court of the people working with communities what problem do you see and what problem do you want to try and help them solve if it's something that we see has value then we will gladly support you uh, with some money and logistical support to help you investigate that. So that will launch sometime next month, later next month. So by all means, keep an eye out for that. 
Uh, we're also working on a toolkit for global innovation hubs. So this might apply again to some of the people on, on the call here that if you've heard about digital identity, you are a little bit confused about what it is and what it isn't. You're interested in how it's being used, maybe how it could be used or maybe how it's not being used. You're interested in what tools might be out there. You're interested in reports and papers um, and assessments of different, uh, different tools and maybe interested in connecting with people who are trying to answer some of these questions and we're looking to build an online space where people can find that information and connect with other people. And we're hoping to launch this hub uh, toolkit in the next sort of three or four months time. And again, as before, it's more about how do we provide people with the tools that they need in order to do what they want to do? Because that's really what we're interested in. It's what problems other people are looking to solve who are living and working closer to the problems themselves. We're also working on something which uh, is actually a variant of a commercial product called Yoti Key. I've got a picture coming up in a second, but it's a small NFC enabled key tag where you can create a digital identity and then it could be carried by someone on this key tag. So they don't need a smartphone, don't need necessarily to have government issued documents if the person that's issuing the key tag is confident that they are who they say they are. Uh, you don't need internet connectivity. So it's a very low tech solution for communities and people that don't have devices or in places where the technology infrastructure is poorer uh, and they can't use other solutions. This is what, what it looks like. It's just a small, in this particular form anyway, this is the commercial product, whether the one that we provide for the humanitarian sector is that form factor or not is something we're discussing internally, but it's, it's this sort of size. So you can imagine somebody would come into a, a microfinance institution perhaps uh, or a bank or maybe a rural hospital, they're enrolling for a program or taking out a loan or, or whatever it might be. There would be a number of questions that would be asked about that person, maybe some proof of identification. Their picture would be taken, that data would be encrypted and then pin protected from a pin selected by that person and then written to this key. And every time they come back into the microfinance institution or into the hospital or into the refugee camp or wherever it might be, they would tap this key onto an NFC enabled tablet, say, and it would bring up and then put the pin in. It would then bring up their details so that you can be confident that the person was with you who is with you today is the same person that was with you last time. So if you're handing out money, for example, that's pretty important. If you're giving treatment for an infection, that's pretty important. Uh, if you're collecting cash and a cash payment program for refugees, that's pretty important. So this is one way we're trying to think about how we could unlock more basic, simple identity challenges using very low tech, but appropriate solutions. We're also committed to research. We've already done research across Africa and Southeast Asia, which led us to the development of that offline product. But we're very interested again in just trying to understand issues closer to the ground uh, than many of the research uh, efforts that take place today do. We're interested in digging right down into the weeds to try to best understand motivations and, and opportunities for digital identity. And then we're also later this year going to issue a number of innovation challenges. So based around digital identity, how people might want to use perhaps our offline product or how they might want to use another product. Uh, if we um, like the idea, like what they're trying to do, believe it has social change potential, then we will support it with some money uh, and some logistical support and maybe technical support to allow people to to build out those solutions. And once again, the common theme is how do we help people do what they want to do and how do we help them build the kinds of things that they think need to be built in order to solve those problems. And then hopefully starting next year, we hope to bring a lot of this together in an annual event where we can showcase the work of the fellows, showcase the work of people using the offline tool that we've developed and made available. Um, we can showcase the winners of the innovation challenges. Oh, and just one thing to add, I think, which is particularly relevant to the Mephos community is that the offline key, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, that will be fully open source. So people will be able to take the code that we write to create that and the menus and screens and so on and add on top of that themselves. So um, given Mephos and the open source community are very close, um, it's obviously a, a sensible thing to be doing uh, more broadly, but particularly relevant to people on this on this call. And then we also have a few other things that um, we do. We offer the OT service for free to registered nonprofits. We give staff time off for um, five days a year, fully paid to go and help social causes. 
We also make our London office meeting space that can hold about 40 or 50 people available to charities um, in the evenings and so on to hold events. So we do a number of side things, which just, again, just kind of further uh, take advantage of the position that we're in to help organisations that might not be able to do certain things. Um, the principles that we have, uh, which are the principles which guide the business as well as the social impact programme, um, to always act in the interests of our users, to enable privacy and anonymity, to keep sensitive data secure, be transparent and accountable, encourage personal data ownership, enable um, upfront consent and data minimization, keep our community safe and make Yoti available to anyone. Um, those are the, uh, the guiding principles of the business uh, and they're also the guiding principles of the social impact program. We don't think that people who are perhaps vulnerable or living in developing countries or last mile communities deserve anything less just because they are disadvantaged in any way. So we are looking to apply those across uh, all of the work that I'm also doing. And we have an independent guardian council, which are independent experts who are um, expert or qualified in certain areas where they can help Yoti with ethical or other challenges it might be grappling through, give advice about whether Yoti is doing the right thing to challenge us, to make sure that we think differently, they're independent, so they can say what they think. There's no uh, incentive for them to just go along with what we're doing. Uh, and I was originally a member of the Guardian Council for about two years, up until last April when I moved over and joined the, the company full time. Um, just a slide about me, which I can skim through, but just in short, I've been working in technology for development for about 25 years now. Uh, developed a, a messaging platform called Frontline SMS a few years ago, which did particularly well and helped unlock a whole range of messaging solutions for many organizations across about 190 countries. And so I, I feel very lucky to be at a company like Yoti and to be given the chance to help develop a program at a particularly opportune time for digital identity, which, as we've mentioned earlier, is becoming um, increasingly critical and important for people out there. Uh, last slide here, you can read a bit more about the strategy I've outlined on the social impact side uh, at yoti.com slash impact. Um, there's also copies of the research that we did, which helped us think about the offline key solution, which we hope to have out in the next three or four months in beta. Um, and also there you can obviously get details of the commercial activities and the Yoti app and Yoti sign and the other things that we do uh, to help people make digital identities work for them. So that's some um, that's it from me. So I guess maybe hand back to Ed and see what some um, questions people may have. I hope that was helpful. Hope it made sense. And by the way, I will actually be in Kampala now at ICTD 2019 at the end of April, beginning of May. So if any any of you are there uh, or are planning to be there, um, do let me know. I'd love to love to catch up. OK, thank you. OK, yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Like EOT is really uh, you know, doing a lot in many different spaces. So I'm hoping we could find some, you know, good areas of collaboration to leverage the social impact strategy that you're all putting together. So let me unmute everyone in case they have any questions they'd like to share. And so, yeah, well, uh, raise your hand if you have a question and then I'll unmute you. Or if you have a question, please type it directly into the chat if you want to, you know, learn anything else about the social impact strategy, how YOT could be used on a day-to-day -day basis for potential use cases you're looking to explore. So as I discussed earlier, you know, we'd like to identify some use cases and users within the community who might like to work on a pilot or enable, you know, the MIFOS community to look at forging a proof of concept integration with one of the YOT tools so we could test out and gather some of that learning that Ken is seeking. So, oh yeah, Rachet, let me unmute you so you can share your question. So. And Ken, did you see Rachid's question around data storage? So. Oh, sorry, I think I muted you again, Ken. My apologies, one second. 
I muted everyone, including you. Okay, you can talk now, Ken. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'll keep an eye on that little red button in future. Okay. Um, so Ratchet, yeah, uh, is asking about whether the data is stored centrally and whether that's any more secure than other databases. So um, the way that uh, the EOT app works is, as I mentioned, when you um, when you create your identity, your each attribute is is individually stored. So from a passport, we might get six or seven bits of information, or you might get six or seven bits of bits of information extracted: your date of birth, your nationality, your full name, your passport number, and so on. Each of those is encrypted with a separate key. Um, so you'd have six keys for six bits bits of data, and that key only lives on your phone. So what we do is that there's a backup of the data on our servers, but it's sharded up into different databases. So the encrypted attribute is mixed up with all sorts of other people's encrypted attributes in multiple databases. And so if for some reason someone did uh, get access to the database, they would possibly get, and they could then encrypt it using our um, you know, very, very secure encryption, then they would possibly get my name, um, maybe Ratchet, they'd get your passport number, they might get Ed's date of birth. It would be, I, I mean, the word impossible is always a little bit dangerous to use, but it would be, incredibly challenging to rebuild someone's identity by um, by hacking that database because it's all sharded up. If you lose your phone, um, then of course you have to get your data back. So you would unlock the attributes from our service and get them back on your phone by using your, your biometric information to do that. So it is safe in that it only sits on your phone in a way that it can be read. If you lose your phone, then it's it's impossible pretty much to decrypt it, but then you can reload your identity back onto a new phone by unlocking it using your biometric biometric data. And as I mentioned to you, the, the attributes that are stored backed up on our servers, uh, they're dark to us. We don't have the key to unlock those attributes. So we don't have any way of uh, knowing who you are. And we also don't know how you're using your Yoti if you buy a bottle of whiskey or um, you do something online, we, we have no way of seeing that. that. That's not our business to know that. Did that make sense? Brilliant, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So institutions of higher learning, that's Moses. Okay, um, well, in a sense, we, we're not, really releasing anything with a specific sector in mind. So the the offline key product, for example, um, that I showed you, we have a number of indications from NGOs how they might want to use that. But we've heard from all sorts of different sectors that it might be useful in health, might be interesting, useful in finance, might be useful in displaced peoples initiatives. Um, it could be useful for perhaps teachers to use it to uh, confirm that they are the teacher going into the class to teach and not somebody else. So we don't have any specific targets for higher education or higher learning. But what we're hoping is that people that do work in higher learning um, may well see some potential of what we're doing and then either trial it or test it or give it a go. If we can improve the products by adding things um, to make them more relevant to individual sectors, then we're certainly more than happy to talk about doing that. But we don't have specific targets that we're, um, sectors that we're targeting. We're, we're sort of throwing it wide at the moment just to see the kinds of things that people might want to use something like a digital identity for. I hope that helps you, Moses, okay? Yes, thank you. Thank okay, you, great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and then, Bandele, uh, launching a new microfinance in Q3 2019, wish to integrate Yoti for use by banking agents to sign up new clients. Can an agent use the same mobile to sign up and verify multiple clients? Um, well, the identity, uh, the actual app would be used by the clients in a typical setup. So I suppose the question would be, the people that you're signing up, would they have smartphones, for example? Would they have digital identities that you could read when you're signing them up?
I don't know if I can get an answer to that. That that does impact the answer. Yeah, you can unmute okay. yourself now on the list, so you should be able to unmute yourself from your device. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, got you. Not loud and clear. Right. A number of we we're, we're doing this in uh, in Central Africa. And a number of, and we're trying to uh, address the unbanked or underbanked. So a significant number would not have access to a smartphone or reliable comms, which is why I was asking if we're using an agency model of banking, we want to have field agents who would have smartphones, but we couldn't guarantee all the clients would. But the country we're operating in does have a national identity card scheme for over 18s right so um something like the offline how many how many people would be signing up and i guess there would be interactions after that wouldn't they they would see their agent every few months or something is that right exactly that that's exactly what we're doing it would be significant numbers because of the the market so it's going to be into tens of tens of thousands Right. Well, um, you know, thinking about some of the things we got back when we did the research on the key, a, a possible scenario might be something like this. It might might not fit entirely, but there could be adaptations of it. So uh, somebody who wanted to sign up for an account or the agent went out, met somebody uh, and wanted to register them. If they had an ID document um, or an ID card, uh, then if the agent, for example, say had a tablet which had our offline product on it and a handful of the keys or similar nfc enabled tags they could take the document they could type the uh, information out from the id card take a picture with the tablet and then present that person that they've just registered with a nfc enabled tag and then that would hold that person's identity as collected by the agent and then that data could always then be you know, uploaded or saved or taken back to the head office whenever. And then each time that person met that agent by tapping that key on the tablet, it would bring up the information that was originally entered so that the agent could be confident that the person in front of them is the person that they signed up. That, that second, I, I suspected the key may be the, the way to go. Just out of interest, what sort of uh, unit price per key are we talking about if you're buying in tens of thousands? I would have to check that. I mean, for for beta trials, we are happy to give, you know, give keys out to people to uh, to see whether this might work. There are obviously volume discounts. We don't we don't sell them ourselves. Right. I mean, it's something I could certainly find out if you wanted to connect separately. Um, I could speak to our team. It all depends on the form factor. It depends a little bit on the capacity, how much data you're looking to store. Um, obviously, as well, transmission rates from an NSC enabled device to a key is slower the more data you're using as well. So there's a number of implications, but it's something I could I would certainly be happy to find out. And you know, you could get little stickers. The NSC tag could be a you know a little chip on a sticker which could be stuck somewhere as well. It doesn't need to be in the form that I've shown. But yeah, I can imagine if you're doing tens of thousands, cost would certainly become an issue. Um, it just depends what it's costing to do it now or what costs indirect costs there are by not being able to verify each time we very much welcome taking this offline and following up because we've just about to be granted our banking license and we're raising funds and we're trying to put the agree the comms in place and obviously this is uh, one way of addressing the problem so to be part of a beta would be excellent yeah no absolutely well um yeah let's connect offline i think my email address is somewhere but otherwise ed could share it with you and I'll, okay. yeah, I'll be more than, I'll be more than happy to share more um, after this. I won't take up anyone else's time then. So thank you very much. That's brilliant. No, thanks for your question. Cheers. Um, Obafemi had a question. I think that's the next one. Uh, is it possible to use a mobile smartphone's iris scanner facility in addition to the image of the individual that can be? Um, not at the moment. Not with our solution. No. Um, so the with the offline key, uh, what we're doing, we're not actually taking a bio, creating a biometric of the person's face. We're just storing um, a medium quality JPEG so that 
when the key is represented, the photo of the person's face is brought up and you can simply look at the picture, look at the person, and it's a visual manual check. So you're simply doing a, a verification uh, at a desk to say, yep, the person who's appeared on my screen who's holding this key is the person in front of me. I can tell it's the same face. Um, and then they can get their money or deposit their money or have their injection or whatever it might be. Um, we don't intend yet going much further than that. Um, we could do facial recognition so that the person could look at the tablet um, and then it would be identified from there. But then, of course, you need to start storing more data on the tablet. Tablet could be stolen. People are already concerned about data being lost or misused. So maybe in later versions, there might be something like that um, uh, of a FEMI. But at the moment, nothing, um, nothing in the first version of the, the offline product anyway. Shall I assume that's OK? Yeah, I'll assume that's okay. But Obafemi, if you want to, um... that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, um, Moses. Uh, he says it's his final question. I don't think so. <laughs> um, on the fellowship, can you have an interest in supporting justice system? Legal interest, uh, big challenge in Kenya, injustice in courts. Um, absolutely. I mean, we with the fellowship program, what we're looking to do is just to just think of three or four fairly broad themes um, around perhaps indigenous people, perhaps marginalized people, um, perhaps, yeah, maybe perhaps policy or legal issues or regulatory issues. And then people will be um, welcome to submit. It'll only be a couple of pages. We're not looking for very, very long, detailed um, proposals at the beginning, but just a couple of pages to explain what the problem is, where they are, and why it's important that they are given the opportunity to spend time investigating and maybe offering solutions uh, to it. So something like that, I can imagine, would would quite happily be a fit a fit with those themes. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll be happy to share when the fellowship program is launched. And if if Moses, if you know someone, or if it's you you're thinking of, or whatever it might be, would be more than happy to to hear about what particularly. Um, that person or you are trying trying to solve. I mean, the idea for us is to try and sort of support the unusual suspects. A lot of fellowships, a lot of research money, a lot of the support and funding goes to the research institutions, it goes to universities, it goes to, in many cases, overseas consultants. And what we want to do is support people. You know, if there's a Kenyan who sees a very, very big problem with um, the legal system in Kenya around identity or people not being able to prove themselves or whatever, um, then I would much rather see a Kenyan get the money to, to help solve a Kenyan problem than give it to an American. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for that. You're welcome. Um, and if you do have a final question, don't, don't be shy to put it in. I know you said that was your last one, but if you do have another one, I don't mind. Um, what are the identities Yotis connected for India? Um, so, Aaron, we I know we are... We either just have or are about to um, roll out support for Adha with the app. So um, India, in fact, is one of our biggest markets at the moment. I think we are growing faster in India than we are in other other territories. Um, we've just opened an office in Bangalore. Um, we're recruiting quite aggressively there. Um, we're recruiting teams of document checkers uh, and so on. So it's a big market for us. Um, I know Adha is is part of our mix now it, it very 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 soon will be um, so uh, you will be able to using um, using Yoti in India you'll be able to um, store the credentials from passports and driving licenses Aadhaar and so on and and use them on various sites and in various ways to prove who you are is that okay Aaron I'll assume that is if I don't, if I hear a scream back. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Um, the slides. Yeah, how happy to to send a PDF to Ed, and then um, if Ed wants to distribute that the best way, um, I'll leave it up to him. But yeah, the, all of those slides are, are public anyway. The the business ones come from a wider business deck, which I could send a link to uh, to Ed for that if you want the fuller business one. And then the social impact slides come from 
the launch blog post. So if you look on the EOT blog, you'll see last month we wrote a launch blog post which explains the background to the strategy and the, the, the whole slide deck for that can also be downloaded from the website. But I can certainly share the compiled one that I shared today um, and Ed can, can distribute that, no problem. Where can I find a list of the countries for which national ID cards can be verified? So that is on, I'm gonna flick off and look at my bookmarks a second because I actually have a list of this um, country supported. So I will paste this into the chat message. Uh, here it goes. Okay, that should be, that link should be appearing in the chat. That gives you a list of uh, the countries where passports and driving licenses and national identity cards are currently supported. Um, we're adding them all the time, as you can imagine. So it's a rapidly evolving list, but 160 uh, countries, 160 passports is not far off every country, um, 40 odd left, I guess. Uh, and then the others, obviously driving licenses and so on, um, we are, um, and ID cards are adding, adding all the time. And just to say, when these documents are scanned, uh, when you've created your base, EOT um, digital identification, when they are photographed and sent through, our, our teams do do, um, as well as obviously being able to us being able to break your identity down for you into your attributes, but there are uh, pretty comprehensive checks around fraudulent um, documents being uploaded. Um, so, uh, you know, for EOT to be the world's trusted identity platform, we have to be very confident that the document that we're using to create your identity is genuine. Uh, and is not fraudulently obtained, and that you are the person using your own documents and not someone else's. They're, they're pretty critical. So that link should have everything there. Well, thank you for sharing that link, Ken. And that sort of like dovetailed into my question. So that would first be one of the, if an institution was looking to like, let's say, you know, roll out their own EKYC or digital identity verification, a prerequisite would first be they need to be in a country where there is a form of a national ID or ID or license that EOT already supports being scanned into your digital ID solution. Is that correct, Ken? Yeah, if you're using the if you're using the smartphone app, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, obviously, okay. if you decide. Yeah. Sorry, Ed. Go on. Oh no, no, keep going. So. Yeah. Um. As I say, yeah, with the with the app, that's clearly that's the the fully trusted um, global platform. So yes, we. Um, we can only provide a trusted identity for someone in a country where we know um, the formats of passports and driving licenses and ID cards, know what they look like, and we can be sure that they're not they're not fraudulently or just made up on a on Photoshop. With the with the offline key, of course, the um, the verification is done by you. So, if um, if a microfinance institution is you know, a staff member or an agent is out in the field um, meeting people who are holding an ID card say a Malawi ID card, which we might not support, uh, and they're presenting that as their proof of identity, then the agent would, if they're creating a key for that person, would be the person who would be doing the verifying, right? So you'd need to make sure that the staff are meeting whatever requirements are required legally in that country. Maybe they're taking a picture of it, I don't know, or maybe they're just writing down other details or getting a signature, but whatever it might be, it would be the responsibility of the the issuing person of the key to do the checking. Whereas in the fully blown Yoti smartphone app, which has 160 country support, we're the ones who verify that the document is valid and that the person holding the document is that person. But we clearly can't do that with a, a rural community in you know, nor Northern Malawi somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And then for the efforts you're doing at a government level, are there any movements or is EOT trying to be involved in helping establish, you know, a national ID program or the equivalent where the country doesn't yet have one? Or is it more, you know, leveraging their existing national ID and then providing them a means of their constituents digitally accessing yeah. information I mean, using their ID? Yeah. So in a sense, it's already happening. Um, obviously, you know, in countries where 
identities are compulsory um, and you know they're forced on people then that that's not the kind of activity that we would necessarily want to be supporting we want people to have personal choice and freedom to choose to have a digital identity and then to use it in ways that they want to so so the yoti app um, in jersey for example so the example i gave a bit earlier about the states of jersey the states of jersey have decided that rather than issuing their own island-wide official identity document that they will let citizens choose whether they want to interact with the government this way and if they do they have decided that yoti provides the best solution for them to do that so the you know we obviously support jersey passports jersey driving licenses so a citizen there would use their yoti as their official government identity uh, and in Scotland, uh, the improvement service there are also beginning to trial the use of Yoti for individuals to access their government services in that country. So there are the the activities and the kinds of things that are beginning to happen. They they very much resemble national ID programs in that a government will say, we now support this particular product. If you want to interact with us digitally, download that product and use it. We endorse it. Um, that's happening. But um, I, I can't speak for the company more broadly because I work on the social impact side. But I think it's unlikely that we would necessarily, say, get involved in uh, advising the Nigerian government on how to issue ID cards to everybody. Um, if, if the Nigerian government decided that the Nigerian citizens would or should be allowed to access government services uh, online using Yoti, then that's obviously a different, uh, different thing altogether. But we are getting increasing interest from governments around the world um, in them supporting OT as a way for their citizens to um, access government services. OK, and then going back to my first question, like in the example where somebody you know, did want to roll out like their own digital identity or EKYC or identity verification solution just provided they're in one of the countries, one of these 160 countries. They could use it they don't need to get any like government buy-in if it's just internally for you know how they verify identity and need to access information is that correct um as far yeah as far as i'm aware that'd be correct yeah okay okay thanks and i think obafemi had another question there ken and then we'll you know take we'll do a last call for questions and then we can wrap up so i think there's about two more questions if you've got time from ken yeah, no, no, absolutely. More than happy to while everyone's here. Um, so Obafemi, yeah, healthcare, how would the Yoti work with children and their parents or legal guardians? Um, well, I, are we talking the, the the offline key? Yes, yes indeed. So um, imagine that a parent is bringing a child along age one. Um, yep. How would the verification of that child's identity and them being the responsible adult work? And, you know, three years later, five years later, um, how how would that work? What 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 solutions or ways of thinking around managing that that issue? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, um, I think for me this is a great example of why we're throwing this out to the world because we would um, that would not necessarily be a problem we'd be aware of um, because we're not a healthcare provider um, right. and uh, you know we don't spend our time where healthcare providers do in rural communities or dealing with these kind of problems. So I would anticipate just off the top of my head, I mean, these are the things that you know, the feedback is going to be great because that could be one of the things that comes back from the first beta trial of the key. Oh, you know, we actually need to do this, but we can't. Or how do you think we could do it? Off the top of my head, perhaps for the, at least the early stages that the, the image that's taken of the child, the parent or the parents of, of the child or guardian is in the same picture. Right. Okay, and that's the way around it, right? I mean, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm just thinking about how, in its first iteration, how it may be used to solve that particular problem. So, if you did have the child and the adult or the parents in the image, then you could, when the image is presented from the key, the parent would obviously have to unlock the key because the child wouldn't have a pin. Mm -hmm. um, but when that's done, you could then be sure that the parent sitting with the kid and the key is a legal guardian. Or at least yeah. at the time of the being registered as a legal guardian. Yeah, I think there's there's probably a, a number of ways of approaching this sort of thing, but that that's a real problem. And uh, the reason I'm asking is because obviously low tech, uh, low cost solutions can make a significant impact in terms of saving lives. 
um, for people in terms of healthcare and um, certainly something looking at. So maybe we can pick that up offline and uh, just look at ways of exploring those those sorts of things. Yeah, no, I'd love to absolutely. And you know, we're really keen with this. Once once we've got it available to you know, we'll give we'll give free keys to people um, to be able to play with it. But you know, we we would love people to take it and actually come back to us with that very you know that very question. Like, look, there's a problem we have here, and we could do it this way, but maybe if we tweaked the software, it could be done better. Um, you know, I'm a last mile sort of person. If it hasn't come across already, I love I love being in infra infrastructure challenged environments and going to places where most technology won't reach. And so yeah. I, I love those kinds of problems. And yes, absolutely. Um, as before, I'm more than happy to discuss offline how we might be able to keep in touch and help with any specific use cases of that offline product. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, the uh, Umar's um, integrating IoT within MIFOS for KYC. Um, the answer would be yes. Um, on that developer page, so yoti.com slash developers, you would get all the information you would need. I don't know what Mifos is written in, um, but I yes, think we the would. Java, yeah, probably the Java SDK then that we'd have to use from the IoT side, Ken. Right. Yeah, we have, a, we, have a, we have a Java SDK. So yes, you would simply. And then what you could do then, the Mifos site could present when somebody um, wants to log into their account or present something, share something with Mifos. Uh, through the website, then um, you would be able to, they, if they had Yoti, they would be able to share the, any attributes of their identity that you were requesting from them through um, through that. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, but go to yoti.com slash developers and it should all be there. Okay, yeah, now that'll be definitely an action item. I'll have like one of our technical members of the community try and take the lead on that. And so we can answer yeah, more if anyone, questions. If anyone gets stuck, just let me know. Um, Lamine had a question on it. It's a private one by the looks of it. It's come straight to me. But how, how do we compare to other identity solutions? It's a good question. Um, I think the one thing that's, that for me that stands out for Yoti or about Yoti is the fact that your data is not our business model. Um, we are looking to provide people with a, a genuinely private, um, user-owned digital identity where they have full control and ownership over that, and only they choose which elements of that they share with whoever, whoever it is they're trying to do something with. And the fact that we can't read your data, the fact we can't see what you use your Yoti for, we know nothing about you. Um, when you uh, transact or share an attribute of your identity with a site, only you and that site know that that was shared, um, and we don't. Uh, so if law enforcement come asking us uh, about how you're using your YOT, for example. Um, it's incredibly challenging for us to be able to tell them anything, to be honest with you. So I think the thing that I like about it, and I think that makes it stand out um, as the ethics of the privacy by design, are by the fact that it actually walks the walk when we talk about you owning and managing and controlling your own data. That is actually what it is. And it's not something we've added in the last year because that's become a very, very trendy thing to add. The app's been in development since about 2004, and it was very much built in from the beginning. So I think ethically, with our strong principles and with our guardian council, who are the, the outside advisory council, who are not obligated at all to agree with us, they are there to challenge us, they are there to call us out and to say, no, 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 you should not be doing that. Um, you know, We are looking to constantly be reminded that we are user focused and we need to be doing things that are right by the user. Uh, and I think that approach is how it should be. Uh, it's just that many companies, as we know, almost weekly, uh, with all the various scandals and data issues, um, either don't take security and privacy se seriously. So, you know, if passwords aren't protected in databases or passwords aren't um, encrypted in databases or data is shared, you know, LinkedIn sharing images with Microsoft, not LinkedIn, sorry, the Flickr sharing images with Microsoft to do AI stuff that people didn't even know about. Um, that, that's not, not what we're about. So I think trust is the key. Um, we're a business built on trust. Uh, and if we lose that trust, we have no business.
Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. This was a really informative session. And thank you to everybody who attended and all of the great valuable questions and answers we had at the end. I found that really worthwhile. And I'll send along the recording of the screencast, the link to the slides that Ken shared. And then, Ken, I think you have everybody's email addresses. And I'll send Ken's email address if anybody needs to follow up directly. But want to, you know, thank you, Ken, for all your time and looking forward to collaboration between members of the MIFOS community and ecosystem and YOT and taking advantage of the social impact strategy you all are launching. Thanks so much. And just to, just to reiterate, we're um, we're very, very keen to work with you all on, on problems you're trying to solve. So um, our, our door is open. Just email me and we'll be very responsive and we'll look to help you as much as we can. Thank you very much.